Okay, good afternoon, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are in the world, because we seem to be attracting a, an international audience here on in Conservation Wave. And today I'm really excited because, I mean, I'm excited all the time, but I'm particularly excited because I've got a good friend of mine, Jonathan Mayrav, who is from Israel, and he and I have been hanging out for a long time. Um, Jonathan, you tell me, 10 years now. Yeah, coming up 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you just think to yourself, where does the time go? It's just an incredibly long period of time. But um, Jonathan um, and I go back a long way, as I say, but Jonathan is a very, very important uh, conservationist um, in his part of the world and also throughout the world. And we'll learn more about his work very, very shortly. Um, I'm going to go straight into it because I need to, I think some people may not necessarily know you that well, may have heard of you or may even have heard of uh, Champions of the Flyway, but we're going to talk about all those things today. But I want to start at the very beginning, but before I do that, let me just ask you, Jonathan, um, how has the lockdown been for you? Because I know that Israel was one of the toughest countries going when it came to you know, initially sort of reacting to it. Um, indeed, in Israel, we started the, the lockdown measures uh, very early and uh, very tight. Uh, actually, it was uh, and uh, we a lot of us thought that it was too aggressive, too fast. Uh, in the long run, it might have been the right way to go. But uh, Israel came in very, very early. Um, Mid March, uh, already things started. Uh, fortunately for myself and some of my colleagues uh, in BirdLife Israel, uh, we continued working as usual. Um, we have various, a lot of field work, uh, surveys and, and monitoring projects that were already paid for that had to be completed uh, during this uh, breeding and migration season. So ironically enough, birding and uh, field work was, we had essential worker, essential worker passes and it was fantastic. It was beautiful. The roads were empty. No one was out. And uh, we could go out and, uh, and do our field work. And actually, during the month of April, uh, my colleagues and myself uh, did more time in the field than we do, you know, any other year. Because usually I'm busy with other things, uh, tourism, conservation. Uh, and this time it was pure field work uh, for nearly a full month. So for me personally, the lockdown was beautiful. Too bad they're opening up. <laughs> if only birders around the world could have been seen as essential workers, that would have been the perfect thing, you know, I think totally. And uh, you, so you we were talking before this actually started recording and you were talking about some of the birds that you've been seeing this spring. Can you kind of uh, tell us, can you make our, our mouths water, please? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's been a fantastic uh, migration season. Um, large waves uh, of uh, the common migrants. But Israel had a very, very uh, wet winter this year. It was a record winter. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is full to the brim, which is something that uh, didn't happen for 30 years. Um, and the desert received huge amounts of uh, rainfall. And as a result, we, the desert species breeding season was out of this world. Uh, including some very rare species uh, like thick-billed larks uh, and Arabian duns lark, uh, which we have uh, over 40 breeding pairs of duns larks. That's, that's uh, a duns lark, isn't it? Yeah. And the uh, duns lark is one of those birds that people visiting Israel uh, every spring or when they come, it's one of those things that they really want to see, but they're always very, very rare and very elusive, and one shows up here, one shows up there. And this year, finally, we have a major breeding event and they're very easy to see and there's no one here uh, from overseas to see them. So I could see Don smiling over there. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I, um, I, I was thinking earlier when you mentioned that, that I'd seen them in South Africa, but I suddenly realized that the species I saw, which was now called, or then called this long-billed lark, was actually split from the DuPont's lark. That's why... Okay. That's why I um, probably didn't recognize when I was talking about it. So, yeah, fantastic. I mean, I've been to Israel several times and, um, and mostly, in fact, all the time is at your invitation. And 
it's the birding there is absolutely phenomenal. I think my favorite moments birding in Israel are when um, we're in wadis, so in those oasis in the middle of scrubby, well, middle of nowhere, you've got an oasis, or sitting, uh, uh, you know, and watching the raptors drift overhead in the mountains, in, um, in that mountains, or standing on North Beach looking at the Dead Sea and um, seeing, you know, all these waders like greater sand plovers and, and watching uh, slen slender bill gulls and um, white eyed gulls, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's just amazing. Jonathan, you started an interest in birds from a very early age, um, say, say 10 years old. So our American friends always ask, did you have a, a spark bird? Did you have a moment when suddenly you thought, this is it? Um, not really. Uh, I was, uh, it started more with general nature. Um, me and three, three of my good friends, when we were in fifth grade, uh, we would roam around the, the fields and orchards around my hometown, and uh, we called ourselves the Nature Gang. Um, we were, you know, the cool nerds. <laughs> and uh, basically, we were interested in all aspects of nature, you know, reptiles and birds and critters and whatever. And uh, for me, I slowly started to, I'm very fortunate to grow up in Israel where, you know, as a child, you lift your head and see 3,000 storks uh, migrating over your head. And I remember at a very young age, uh, huge kettles of storks and, and raptors. And uh, that caught my eye, that migration uh, phenomena. And I was very fortunate in sixth grade to have a teacher in elementary school that saw my interest in birds. And she brought me along with her uh, to a birding workshop that was intended for teachers for the Board of Education. And she brought me and another friend. Um, and that was when I really got into the whole uh, birding thing. And it slowly evolved. Um, I was lucky that when I was a younger child, I lived in the U.S. for four years. So I spoke good English. Because in Israel, there was very limited resources in Hebrew uh, in the 80s. And uh, basically, that's I got. I had friends send me from the UK a Birdwatch magazine, you know, from the early '90s, and uh, and things like that. And uh, I would read them, you know, and uh, that's that's really how I got into it. And then, you know, joined the Young Birders Club, and uh, from there, 30 years have flown by, and here we are. <laughs> um Whenever I think of you, I think of Ilat and the Negev Desert. But you're, where are you from in Israel? Where did you? Where were you raised? Uh, I was raised in the center of the country, um, not far from Tel Aviv. And uh, but when I was 14, I went to uh, to Sdeboker, to the Negev Desert, to a, a college for environmental studies, a high school for environmental studies, uh, which was a boarding school. Uh, and there I did nothing but, you know, run around the field uh, all day. Uh, sometimes went to class, but most of the time uh, just uh, was out in the field. And uh, that's where, you know, those were the years where I got really, really serious and got, fell in love with desert birding and, and desert migration phenomena. Um, and yeah, Israel's a tiny country, you know, so I live smack in the middle also now and it's very easy to you know, three hours to Eilat and three hours to the northern border. So basically. Yeah. Can you explain, uh, for those who may not know, the importance of Israel as a migrational route for birds? Yeah, Israel is the uh, first uh, land bridge or the first slither of land uh, east of the Mediterranean Sea that connects uh, Eurasia, Europe and Asia, to Africa in the south. So most birds prefer not to cross uh, large bodies of water. So they fly over Israel instead of attempting uh, to cross the Mediterranean Sea. So Israel is a huge migration corridor for birds uh, nesting in Eurasia uh, as they go south to winter in Africa and then back up in the spring. Uh, so that's one main reason. The, the big, we're actually the second largest migration corridor uh, in the world after uh, the Atlantic Flyway of the Americas. Um, we are more diverse, uh, but they have more birds in terms of numbers. Yeah. Um, and then Israel is also a meeting of zootopical zones. 
which means that uh, we have African species uh, that we are the northernmost point of their distribution. We've got European species that were the southernmost point of their distribution, and we've got Asian species that were the westernmost point uh, of their distribution. So a country which is uh, 340 miles or 320 miles, uh, 500 kilometers, uh, we now have 548 species uh, in Israel, which is quite remarkable compared to the size of the country. It's incredible. I mean, I've, as I said, I've been a few times and I'm just spellbound. I mean, even in Elat, in right at the very southern end of the country, and Elat is, <coughs> excuse me, Elat is not one of the most beautiful places at all. I think it's a pretty ugly city, if you don't mind me saying yeah. so. No, yeah, I agree. <laughs> But, you know, even in the crappy park where people are lying around drunk and there's not much cover, yet, I mean, the amount of birds that pass through that, what's the park called again? I've, I've forgotten what it's called now. Well, there, there's a few of them. I assume you mean Ophira. Yeah, Ophira, uh, yeah. You get Rhinex, uh, Rhinex in the grass and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really remarkable. It's like an urban birder's paradise. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. So you did uh, environmental studies at Ben Gurion uh, College, and you fell in love with desert and birding and, and the desert itself. You were monitoring, uh, you know, complicated families to recognise, such as larks and the wheat ears. I mean, the wheat ears. I mean, there's so many different types of wheat ears to observe in Israel. Um, you are also probably the most experienced guide in Israel. Um, in terms of your identification skills and stuff, and I know that for sure because I've, I've been with you. Um, what are the, I mean, aside from migration, what are the birds that people come to Israel most to see? Besides migration, like I said, we've got a lot of uh, regional uh, specialties. Uh, the desert, you know, Israel is a very modern country with a very European or modern feel to it compared to other Middle Eastern countries. So it's much easier to access uh, desert birds and desert locations in Israel compared to other places. Uh, so we've got, like you say, a very good representation of uh, wheat ears and larks in the desert, uh, five species of sand grouse, which are always high on the wish list, uh, McQueen's bustard, uh, probably one of the most impressive terrestrial uh, birds in the world where Israel basically holds the last remaining uh, wild population. Um, Cream-colored courser, uh, very good numbers of breeding birds of prey. Um, we got Mount Hermon in the north, which is, uh, has uh, birds which are more similar to Turkey and the Caucasus, all kinds of uh, montane species where you, that you can't see anywhere else in the country. Um, Israel, like I said, it's very small, but the diversity of habitats is remarkable and the amount of open space, uh, agricultural areas, natural areas, semi-natural areas, uh, are still very much very prominent. So basically anywhere you go, you'll find birds. Uh, so you've got the, uh, the desert owl. Is it the Humes owl or desert owl? Well, it's desert owl. Uh, it was formerly known as Humes owl. Um, but there was some taxonomic work uh, that was done in 2013 and 2014. And uh, what was formerly known as the uh, Hume's owl is now called desert owl or desert tawny owl. Um, it was reclassified and renamed after Hadoram uh, Shirichai, one of the uh, gurus of uh, the birding in Israel. And it's now called Strix Hadorami, uh, out of respect uh, to Adoram. And yeah, it's right up there, uh, Nubian Nijar. Our Nubian Nijar is a special one uh, compared to the ones in East Africa. The Nubian Nijars uh, live only in the salt marshes of the Southern Dead Sea, uh, and they need tamarisks uh, as opposed to the acacia trees that they use uh, in East Africa. In Israel, they're strongly dependent on specific tamarisks, and they're most likely a separate species. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to look at. Absolutely. And uh, since 2010, you serve as the tourism director of the Israel Ornithological Center. Um, and you spend quite a lot of time during the year guiding foreign bird watchers, as you say. So, uh, and you also organize several uh, large scale international events, such as the Hula Festival, which I've been to. 
up in the north and the Elap birding festivals and seminars on bird uh, conservation and more. So you are a busy man. Yeah, I'm fortunate. I'm really fortunate to, you know, have birding uh, intertwined with my professional life, really. It's a... Uh, I did. I never uh, went. I mean, I, I can't say that I never went to school. I was in university for three months. Uh, it took me three months to realize that it's not for me, uh, and I left. And uh, now I tutor PhD students and uh, teach in private colleges. So the academic background. I'm more of a field birder rather than the academic, uh, the classic academic ornithologist. So yeah, I'm. I'm you know, I'm fortunate to be able to work with birds year round. And not so long ago, you had a eureka moment um, and you suddenly happened upon an idea which you put into place and now has become one of the uh, ornithological fixtures in the calendar. Can you tell us how you came up with the thoughts and ideas for um, Champions of the Flyway? And, you know, what, what is Champions of the Flyway? So it all started with, uh, first of all, the idea came, it, it was not just me, it's together with uh, Dan Alon, uh, the director of the Israel Ornithological Center. And uh, when we saw the success, uh, we started the Eilat Bird Festival in 2006, um, and it evolved and grew from year to year. And uh, around 2012, we thought about that we need a new gimmick, we need a new sort of idea to put a lot and put Israel back, a, you know, to do more. And uh, we were toying with the idea of holding a bird race in Israel. Um, I personally like bird races, you know, it's not the most fun uh, birding. Uh, it's not the most romantic kind of birding, uh, a bird race, but um, basically uh, I really wanted to do a bird race in Israel. And, uh, but we could not figure out how to do it uh, without losing our pants, you know, economically. And, uh, and then I was invited to participate in the World Series of Birding in Cape May, uh, staged by New Jersey Audubon. They invited me to join their team of board of directors uh, in May 2013. So I went to New Jersey and I participated uh, and I spent the, my whole time there basically picking their brains uh, about their model uh, of a bird race. Um, the World Series of Birding, which actually was yesterday, they also had to do, a, they always do it at peak migration in the US and they also had to modify it, of course, this year to the lockdown restrictions. And they did sort of uh, similar to what everyone's doing, you know, bird in your immediate area. Um, so my visit there was really a pivotal moment because I spent my whole time there picking their brains, trying to figure it out. And when I came back, I had quite a lot of ideas about how to do it. And uh, Dan, Dan Alon and I put together an idea of involving the conservation element uh, thickly into it. And we approached BirdLife International that summer. Um, and the director of BirdLife International at the time, uh, Marco Lambertini, uh, really liked the idea and told us that, uh, you know, gave us the, you know, the green light to, uh, that BirdLife will join and support us. And that's how it started. Uh, basically, a bird race for conservation. It was very hard to sell the first year um, to ask people to come to Israel. It's, it's not cheap uh, to come, spend money, uh, and then raise money for something else. Because, uh, for example, the World Series of Birding, the participating teams each raise money for their own causes. Uh, and we were the first to think of the idea that everyone pulls together towards one cause. And uh, those were the black years of poaching uh, in Southern Europe, in the Middle East, the Mediterranean basin. And that tied in very, very uh, well to highlight the poaching and the killing of birds on migration. Um, and it all, all the pieces fell into place. I mean, I had to talk to dozens of people, uh, close friends, and then to pester them to come and uh, to, to, you know, slowly, slowly, the first year we had only 14 teams, uh, so you know, you know, you were there, uh, and then uh, slowly, slowly it grew. I mean, I think it's a wonderful project, really. Uh, I'm just sad that I don't participate. 
you know, that I have to sit on the sidelines and then coordinate the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, I think we're very proud of it. Uh, now, six years in, uh, we've raised uh, over half a million dollars uh, for anti-poaching projects. And more important, we've shed light on uh, problems that migrants face along the migration corridors. Uh, and it's become a, a well-known event. And I think, uh, you know, with all due modesty that uh, we're very proud of it. I think it's a, it's a game changer in terms of, of, you know, connecting bird races and conservation and engaging large crowds. So, so we're very proud of it. Yeah, and so you should be. I mean, it, it is an event that is very, very memorable. I mean, I when I had the uh, when I came, I had the pleasure of being uh, involved in the first one. I've been on, um, I think I've been three times in total, maybe four. But on the first occasion, I was with the Media Birders, which included Tim Appleton, who uh, who runs or organises the British Bird Watching Fair, Stephen Moss, my friend Stephen Moss, the writer, and I. And um, everyone shot off at midnight because it's a 24 hour race. We woke up at the respectable time, I think, of five in the morning, had breakfast, cup of tea, and then got in the car and, and poodled off. Um, but there was also a film made of the, uh, the first um, ever Champions of the Flyway, which is readily available on, on YouTube. And I have to say, and I think John will back, Jonathan will back me up. I had one of the best lines in the actual film. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically this year, unfortunately, um, things um, stood in the way, i.e. coronavirus. So, so what happened? We, down to the, I mean, we saw it coming uh, already in January, you know, when the thing sort of popped its head. Uh, we realized that uh, things are going to, you know, we like, I'm sure everyone here and everyone in the world, no one imagined uh, the extent of the lockdown and how the world is going to stop. Uh, I mean, we're sitting here now uh, three months in already. Uh, but at the time, it, it, it was, you know, inconceivable that the air travel will stop and that, that countries will lock down. And then... Um, but come February, we realized that we will not be able to host the international uh, event uh, as uh, international visitors to Israel already in early March uh, were required to do a two-week uh, self-imposed quarantine. Um, and we realized that people are not going to come. Uh, so we decided to do it. We kept uh, insisting on holding the race and to do it for Israeli teams. For Israeli, Israeli team. We actually we had, actually had, uh, we actually uh, had, we actually had more this year this than, year than ever. Ever. Um, including many children, children teams and, and, and youth and students. And so we, we were pushing to do it. Uh, but then as it advanced, we realized that, you know, the country was being locked down and there's no way it's going to happen. And then uh, my dear friend and Champions of the Flyway uh, media coordinator, Mark Pearson, uh, which is an integral part of the team, uh, him and I had a chat and then we said, you know what, let's do a virtual element uh, of Champions of the Flyway. Let's, let, let's open it all up, uh, free up all the rules and let anyone that wants to participate uh, uh, join. And uh, we came up with CLTF uh, 20 Solidarity Day um, and it turned out to be quite a cool move. I mean, we had over 400 people worldwide participating, birding on March 31st um, from 30 countries. And we ended up seeing over 10% of the world's birds uh, on that day. And a lot of these people also raised money um, while doing so. And people all from all corners of the world. So it actually became a lot more international than uh, you know than than we could do when people are here in Israel, so we're actually going to take a few of these ideas uh, to 2021. Uh, this uh, interactive international element, uh, we're still chewing on it and what the exact model will be, but uh, I think that you know I always use this phrase of turning when life hands you lemons. You know you can either 
you know, become sour or make lemonade. And, and in the end, it turned out to be a good call. And, and yeah, we're, COTF 20 is going to be one to remember, that's for sure. So can you give us any hints about uh, um, champs of the, champions of the flyway for 2021? Or are you still... Um, we, we really don't... Uh, what I can tell you is that in next month, uh, we're sitting virtually with BirdLife International um, to talk about the recipients of 2021. Every year we choose a, a specific cause specific conservation cause in a specific country uh, or region where uh, birds face problems. Uh, this year we raised money for uh, step eagle conservation in Kazakhstan. Um, and uh, next year we're going to go probably back to the classic poaching uh, of birds. And um, I, I don't really have any details I can give yet, but uh, there will be details soon. Hey, Becky has asked, what's, what is the name of the film? You know the film that... Um, um, just... If you go to YouTube and uh, look at the champ and search Champions of the Flyway, uh, it should come up. I'm trying to see if I can pull it up uh, right now. What year is it, 2016? I think, uh, no, the first one was uh, 20, yeah, 2016, I think. Uh, no, the first one was actually 2015 or 2014 right. even. So Becky, if you look that up, 2014, you'll see the line what I dropped. That, uh, <laughs> that was quite funny. Um, Here, I'm, uh, I'm attaching, uh, I am attaching the link of uh, the film in the chat window right now. Good, thanks. There's the link. Oh, sorry, it sent me a private to uh, Shailesh. One second. It's up there now. Yeah. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Um, thanks. Gayatri is asking um, Is there a minimum age requirement to join um, COTF? From, a, from an Israeli perspective, no. We've had five-year-olds and six-year-olds participate. Uh, for international travels, it's a bit more challenging. Um, but if they're accompanied by an adult, then I have no problem uh, of birders of any age to participate. Actually, this year we had a team uh, from Poland, um, the Warsaw Woodpeckers, that had a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old that were supposed to participate. And also uh, the Zeiss Bespoke uh, Shrikes, the UK uh, youth team, uh, they're also youngsters. Uh, they had a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old that were supposed to participate. It was the most incredible lineup of teams this year in terms of young birders and female participation. And it was just out of this world. But, uh, you know, I hope uh, we can do a repeat in 2021. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Can you take us through the program? What happens when you know the team lands in Tel Aviv and drives all the way down to Elat? What happens when you get to Elat? Basically, uh, the Champions of the Flyway playing field uh, is from Elat in the south all the way to the northern Negev. So it's basically half of the country of Israel. Um, and it requires this playing field, if you want to do it thoroughly, you need to scout properly. So usually teams come down uh, and spend the first two, three days uh, trying to feel, you know, the playing field and, and to uh, scout around. Um, and then before the race, we have a few uh, formal events, uh, the opening dinner. Uh, we usually have another event uh, sponsored by one of the optics companies, um, sort of like a formal assembly, uh, opening dinner, then the race, and then the award ceremony. So the teams uh, basically bird on their own, we do help. In the first couple of years, we did guided scouting as well. We took people around uh, ourselves, showed them some of the uh, key sites. Um, but basically, people come down and just like every bird race, you spend a few days getting familiar with the area, figuring out your game plan. 
Uh, with bird races, you can be the best birder in the world, but if you don't have a proper strategy and a proper uh, route uh, lined up, then you know, you're not gonna do well. So you need a few days to sort of figure it out and to plan out your day. Um, Champions of the Flyway has a very, very challenging playing field because you've got a lot in the immediate area in the south, which is lush and has a lot of water, and it's a fantastic, it's a, that's the place that holds the largest number of species. And then in the northern part of the playing field in the Negev, you have a few key sites as well, and birds that don't make it that far south. So if you want a chance at a winning list, you need to visit both places and you need to decide which one do you visit in the morning, which one do you visit in the afternoon. And in the middle, you have a large chunk of desert to negotiate, uh, which you need to also bird properly and because there's some desert species that you won't see elsewhere. So, uh, you know, it's affectionately called the Dakar of bird races because it's very, very challenging and you need to strategize to figure it out. So. Yeah. Is is there a is there a strategy that kind of works every year? Well, what's the sort of best strategy? Do you think? No, that's that's the beautiful thing. That I mean, usually the set from the the teams that they have done well uh, over the years uh, chose the north to south strategy, basically meaning uh, you leave a lot at midnight and you drive all the way up to the northern part of the playing field, which is a good two and a half hours away. Uh, you can do some, you know, owling on the way and stuff like that. And then start early morning uh, in the Negev Desert and slowly work your way down south. Uh, that's a, an effective strategy, but we did have teams that took it the other way around that actually started in a lot, worked their way. You can see <laughs> Gary is cracking up <laughs> over there. <laughs> but, um, you know, the race, is, it's been going for six years and we still don't really know what is the ultimate winning strategy. Uh, I think it very much depends on the day, you know, in terms of migrants. Um, so, you know, you have to hit both the north and the south. It's, it's really, it's challenging. It's interesting because the first year I did it, um, the winners were um, the um, Cornell Laboratory. Yeah. And they won it very, very, very mechanically and very statistically by looking at records, looking at their eBird stuff and going to spots where things were seen last. And I always felt that I'd rather be organic and, you know, just go somewhere, go birding, you know. But that strategy did it for them. But I think the following year it didn't work for them. Um, no, it didn't. And they, they, I mean, they, they blew us away because, first of all, the Americans are the ultimate bird racers. It's something that they came up with. They know how to do a proper bird race. When I saw them uh, prepping, you know, sitting with Excel sheets and trying to figure out, you know, they timed the 24 hours down to 15-minute brackets, and they were, method you know, methodical and meticulous and, and uh, we, I, I said, you know, what the heck are they doing? I, you know, I couldn't believe it. And they, three out of the four team members have never been to Israel before. And they came and they hit it out of the park. I mean, they went by dry statistics. They did two dry runs, leaving at midnight, driving up, timing everything along the way. They took it very, very seriously. Uh, and it worked for them. So, I mean, they know what they're doing. Um, but it's too mechanical for me. Uh, yeah, likewise. Like so um, what amount of birds are you talking about in terms of species? How many birds, you know, what, how many species can you, can you get and realise to or think to yourself that, you know, I've, I've got a good chance of winning? Well, what's the kind of the threshold in terms of, you know, you've got a good chance? Well, the winning years, uh, the, the highest numbers uh, in the winning years are uh, in the 170s. Um, the record is 180. I mean, we did pass 180. Um, my colleagues, Yoav and, and, and Barak and friends of mine, the serious Israeli bird watchers, we think that 200 is attainable um, on a good day where everything falls into place and it's a good day of migration. But uh, if you don't have 160, then uh, you might as well uh, throw in the towel. And I think if, you, if you're looking at a chance of winning, then it's 160 and north. Um, and there's some people that just do, you know, eco birding. Like I remember Gary Prescott one year and his team came and cycled around Elat yeah. and just left it at that. 
which was great. I mean, I still had a, a reasonable number of birds in there, at least 140. Yeah. Yeah, the green, the green element is picking up very nicely as well from year to year. Uh, of course, we're all for it uh, on bikes uh, or on foot. This year, we actually had a team that planned to do it on camels. Uh, <laughs> they actually talked with an outfitter with a camel rancher in a lot and uh, wanted to hire camels for the day and to do it, uh, you know, on camel uh, for the gimmick. But... Um, a lot itself and the immediate area will give you 100 to 120 species. Uh, so, I mean, which is quite remarkable for a green big day. And yeah, Gary and his team, that was, that was fantastic to see them, you know, mentoring the youngsters and himself getting so emotional. And they worked hard that day and they, they had a very good day. So the whole green element is very, very cool. Tell us a bit more about the migration in terms of numbers of raptors that come over what numbers are we talking about in the spring um well overall uh, we're talking about something like 3.5 million soaring birds uh, that includes birds of prey storks cranes pelicans um, and of course hundreds of millions of the little guy um, right now we're sort of at the tail end of migration here in israel and the last waves of raptors are uh, Levant sparrowhawks and honey buzzards. Um, you should be getting your first honey buzzards uh, back in Europe uh, any day now. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you, you know, in Spain is a different story. They, you know, I'm talking about the few that still breed in the UK. Uh, have they arrived yet in the UK? It should be any day. People, people have been seen. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, they, they're, they're really remarkable, their migration. We have half a million uh, passing over Israel within 20 days. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Uh, those Eilat Mountains that you mentioned, you go up there in you know, April 28th or, March fir or May 1st, uh, and you'll get uh, 70 to 100,000 honey buzzards in the morning, uh, which is mind-blowing. Um, so that's really now. Uh, today I had a few hundred. It's trickling down. Um, but yeah, the numbers overall, uh, like I say, well over three million soaring birds. I think we have a question potentially from Shailesh. Hello, Shailesh. Did you want to ask a question? Shailesh? Shailesh? Maybe not. <laughs> you don't want to ask a question, Shailesh? Okay, maybe not. Does anyone else want to ask a question at all? One at a time. You don't all rush. I've got a couple of questions. With, Go ahead. Uh, hang on, I'll even switch my video on. There you go. Um, yeah, with all the dedication and the meticulous planning that's going on for this, there must be a massive prize for all of this. What, for the winners? Yeah. Um, or is it just the honour of winning? Well, in the first years, uh, we had Swarovski Optics sponsor prizes, uh, and those were good prizes, you know, quality optics. Um, we give several awards for Champions of the Flyway. We've got the Champions of the Flyway, the team that saw the most bird species. Uh, they receive a, a nice prize, uh, but we stopped giving away the prizes three years ago. So now it's really the dibs and respect. Uh, we've got the uh, Guardians of the Flyway for the team that raises the most money for the cause. Uh, and they receive uh, binoculars from Swarovski, but they don't get to keep them. They need to donate them to a bird life partner of their choice uh, for children projects or for uh, people that, are, uh, that don't have access to quality optics. And then we have another prize, which is called the Knights of the Flyway, which is uh, named uh, after uh, Bill Thompson III, uh, a good friend from the US that passed away last year, uh, that was one of the, you know, Win, you know, a major wind uh, under our wings when we got going. And uh, so Knights of the Flyway, 
is for the team that does most to promote the race and to spread the word. And they also receive a pair of uh, Swarovski EL binoculars, uh, but they too have to donate them to a charity. So basically it's, uh, it's all about the giving and, and you know, the companionship and friendliness of the race. It's really not the material element. Oh, There's also one nice. prize to give, sorry Claire, there's also another prize that uh, they give, which I love, and that's the prize uh, for, the most, for the team that gives the most information. Yeah, That nice. really, that really yeah, engenders yeah. what this is all about. This is about sharing and it's about giving information, which is, I think is a brilliant prize. Yeah. But is there a, a green prize? Yes. Because you mentioned the eco one for people seeing the most. Yeah, you, get a nice, you get a nice trophy, a green, the green champions of the flyway. It's a separate category. Excellent. Good. Thank you. And it's growing from year to year. We've got more people doing uh, the green element, which is uh, pretty cool. That's nice to hear. OK, we've got a couple of questions. Thank you, Claire, by the way. We've got a couple of questions from Ronique. And Ronique has asked, what is the most sought after bird to see in Israel? Oof, that's a, uh, that's a tough one, you know, to each their own. Uh, where are you from, Ronique? Can you turn your microphone on? Ronique? Ronique? <laughs> anyway, um, what is the most sought after bird? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, different people uh, want to see different things. Um, there are a lot of quality species. Oh, my mic not working from the U.S. Uh, from here, Seattle. Uh, like I say, there's quality species, very rare species like Nubia nightjar or the desert owl uh, or one of the larks or Syrian serin or long-billed pipit or, you know, species which are hard to encounter uh, in the Western Palearctic. Uh, so a lot of people are into those. Um, some people just want to see a hoopoe, you know, for the beauty of it and, uh, and, you know, owls do it for everyone, birds of prey do it for everyone, so I think to each their own. There really isn't a, a, you know, a general answer for this. And you ask, is there a limit to the amount of people who can participate in COTF? Um, I guess you mean uh, the number of people per team or in general the number of people participating overall? Uh, I can tell you that no, there is no limit. A team can consist uh, of how many, however many people as long as they're using one vehicle. So if you want to use a bus and be 40 people, so be it. Um, and uh, no, we encourage, you know, the more the merrier in terms of the number of participants. What's interesting is I'm talking about um, Renick's first question about sought after birds. I saw, I found, I actually saw my a bogey bird species, a, a bird I've been searching the whole of Europe to see. I saw my first one in um, uh, uh, Israel, and that was quail. I spent years trying to see a quail. And two species that I've tried to see in Israel, I've never had seen, a hoopoe lark and a cream colored corsa, both of which I've now finally seen. Um, I've seen them both in Tunisia now, so I can I feel more relaxed next time I come to, to Israel. That's for sure. Um, anyone else um, has Don? any more questions at all? Don, yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Don. Hi, good. Yeah, there's a comment really, Jonathan, that um, I, I took part in 2017 and uh, it was just such an amazing experience. and. For me, I thought one of the great things was really the collaboration between the countries and actually your, your ladies from Palestine, for example, they really struck a chord with me and well, hopefully we've become friends actually since then. And I think, yeah, that yeah. collaboration and feeling of a big family was really overwhelming actually at the end. It was um, such a great experience to take part in. You know, we, um, coming from Israel, uh, you all know that uh, when it comes to politics, uh, we make a lot of noise for such a small country uh, and every person has their own opinions as to what's going on and the uh, politics are engulf engulfing our lives and um, champions of the flyway is completely the other way i mean we think that birds know no boundaries 
and birds are apolitical and we work with our Palestinian colleagues and we work with our Jordanian friends and we'll work with anyone that wants to work with us because uh, people on the ground need to get together and can get together and work together and do great things uh, without you know the masters of puppets you know the politicians that mess everything up uh, so like Don said we work closely with the Palestine Wildlife Society um, uh, there is actually they do a lot of work in Palestine and you know these guys have big fish to fry in their everyday lives and yet they find the time and the capacity to do conservation work in a very challenging area so we give them all the support that we can. Um, so yeah, I mean, Don's comment is right on. And I think that year was when the Turks and the, the, we raised for Turkey that year. And uh, we had the Turkish team. That, that was a really cool year because it was an Israeli-led project that raised money for Turkey, which is a Muslim country, for a project for children of Syrian refugees, uh, which was really, really cool. So. Champions of the Flyway really bridges uh, political gaps uh, and we're very proud of that. And I think that that's the way, you know, that's the only way to go because, you know, there's, we gave war a chance for, you know, over 2000 years. It's not really working. Uh, <laughs> and I think birds can bring people well, together. Well, that's, that's totally, hang on a second. I just got to, I think Shailesh, you got a problem with your mic here. Let's get you mute into uh you can speak again. Um, Shailesh, sorry, Jonathan even. Um, that's really interesting because um, there has been a lot of political problems, I suppose. Uh, people have problems with certain countries around the world. And coming from Britain, you know, some of us used to get stick, used to get, you know, people sort of um, having to go at us for going to Israel. And, you know, the answer I'd give personally is, is what you said, which is the fact that birds bring people together. And at the end of the day, it doesn't, doesn't matter what country any, any conservationist is in, the conservationists are working to save wildlife, which is, as you say, no, has no borders. And also some of the birds that you guys are actually trying to protect end up in the countries, the very countries where people are complaining. What do you say to people who actually do kind of, you know, try and say, you know, don't go to Israel, Israel because of the political situation? Um, you mentioned this, that my day job, you know, besides Champions of the Flyaway is the tourism coordinator and selling tourism to Israel uh, is challenging uh, for, that, for that aspect. What I say is very simple, that uh, I'm an Israeli, I was born in Israel, um, and I have conservation and birds in my blood. It's not my fault that, you know, I, I me and my colleagues and all my friends and, and, you know, we disagree with a lot of stuff that's going on uh, with our government. Uh, we think that a lot more can be done uh, from the Palestinian issue. Um, but the fact that Israel is uh, taking so much heat politically does not mean that we're not going to do our best for bird, con bird and nature conservation in Israel. And um, I think that you can, you can imagine that I get what you're getting, you know, as the stick that you mentioned, I get 24 seven nonstop uh, trying to sell uh, tours to Israel and to promote birding in Israel. Um, but I must say that in the past years, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, people are opening their eyes and seeing that the whole world is becoming just a nutcase and leaders all over the world are just becoming more, you know, extreme and polar. And they, uh, you know, look at Trump and look at China and look at Russia. And I mean, anywhere, look at your government, which is doing a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, all this stuff is something that I think people are now realizing that uh, it's very easy to say, yeah, I boycott this and I boycott that. But when you stop and, and think about it and look at things, uh, you know, a bit, you know, more in depth, then you realize that uh, you need to support conservation, you know, and, and you need to do it now. Because uh, birds, birds are disappearing. Wildlife is disappearing. And I mean, this COVID-19 thing, I mean, uh, this is a serious wake-up call, you know, nature sort of like poking us 
saying, you guys, you know, with all your development in the human race and ta-ta-ta, look at that, one little virus just shuts down the world, all because that we're playing with wildlife and the wildlife trade and all that stuff. So what I can say is that I wish, I wish, I wish that this, uh, you know, world crisis uh, will grab humanity, you know, by the, you know, and, and hopefully some serious thought is given to nature and to wildlife and things change uh, because, you know, it's been quite a wake up call and we're very happy. We're leveraging this now uh, through Society for Protection of Nature in Israel. We're doing all kinds of campaigns in the country uh, around wildlife and wildlife conservation. And I think this is the way the world should go. This is what we need to do once this crisis is, is over, is to put nature, you know, Give, give it the respect that it's due, because uh, if not, it will come back and bite us, you know. Well said, Jonathan. I mean, you know, people who say they boycott places, I, I don't see how boycotting helps anything. As you say, and as we've all been saying earlier, you know, conservationists are doing a job which is international, regardless of where they are in the world. You know, I've been to places like, for example, I went to Faroe Islands and I had followers stop following me because of pharaohs, the Faroe Islands, hunting of whales. But the thing is, you can't change things by sitting in your armchair, pointing fingers. You know, you have to basically go and see for yourself. And also, the more people that go to these places, the more the local people realize, well, hang on a minute, we're actually making more money from tourism than we are from doing what we normally do. And it may change minds, especially when people who live in those countries actually see other people coming to to enjoy things that they didn't actually put a value on before. And also a lot of people that, that kind of, you know, boycott or, or point fingers, they're the same people who will jump to go to Japan or to Norway or to Iceland. Again, countries with a terrible record when it comes to whale hunting, for example. So there's, a, I think, a lot of um, hypocrisy going on as well. But um, I think there's uh, any country that you look at nowadays, you can find <clears throat> pros and cons. Um, I mean, I have friends and people that we both know that uh, are that will not go to the U.S. ever since Trump is in power. Uh, I'm not talking about you know not even getting into China and and Asia and African countries and a lot of these countries, especially in Africa, that people choose not to go to because of various things. Um, actually Actually, these are the exact places and organizations that need the support the most. Ecotourism can make a change in many of these places. So you need to support ecotourism and you need to support and not, you know, not start thinking about, you know, what the government policy is. And, and I mean, I respect anyone that says I'm not going because ABC, you know, it's a free country. It's a free world. Do whatever you want. But I think that you need to look in a bit deeper. And uh, people are, people are looking in uh, a bit more in depth now. And, uh, you know, when you do good things that are conservation related, I mean, the numbers of participation in champions and the number of birding tourists and eco-tourists that come to Israel is growing from year to year. Uh, hopefully, uh, despite this stall now, uh, that, you know, that will continue. Yeah. Dawn here has asked a question. She says, spring obviously is amazing in Elat. But what other times are good for visiting? And I wonder, Dawn, are you talking just about Elat or, or Israel in general? But anyway, she's asking, is winter good, for example? Anytime. <laughs> I mean, fall migration is just as spectacular. Winter is amazing, especially in the northern valleys. I mean, David can attest uh, to the uh, Hula. The Hula Valley in northern Israel is just one of those incredible uh, birding destinations. Israel hosts huge wintering populations, uh, so any winter visit will give you a fantastic uh, diversity of birds and nice spectacles, you know, like 40,000 cranes in the Hula. Uh, best place in the world to see, you know, good numbers of Eastern Imperial Eagle, uh, Greater Spotted Eagle, Saker Falcon, Sociable Plover. Um, you know, there's a lot of mouth-watering stuff to see uh, in winter as well. The weather is so much better than in the UK. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a good getaway. Uh, I, I think that besides, you know, the slower months, like June, July, August, uh, which are slower, still there's a lot to see. I mean, you go out 
uh, in July and you'll see amazing stuff, you know, uh, breeding, beaters, rollers, uh, calandra lark, black-headed bunting, Mount Hermon is amazing, uh, you know, crimson-winged finch, Syrian serin, sombre tits, um, largest, <laughs> largest concentration of breeding short-toed eagles in the world, um, long-legged buzzard, huge breeding population. Israel is very conservation-oriented and very nature-protective. Uh, there's no game hunting in Israel. Um, so there's birds everywhere. And so, yeah, to, to make a long story short, anytime you come, you know, I'll take you and show you some amazing birds. It's also a brilliant place for barn owls, isn't it? Haven't you not got the, some of the highest, if not the highest density of barn, breeding barn owls in the world? Is that right? Uh, I don't know about the world, but yes, we have a very cool project uh, that's been going on since the 90s of uh, nest boxes for barn owls in agricultural areas. Uh, that goes very well with the organic trend of organic farming. Um, there's 2,000 barn owls in Israel with close to 50% of them uh, being used every year. I actually uh, did some ringing of chicks this morning in a barn owl box. Uh, not far from home. Uh, yeah, very large density uh, of barn owls. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Ronik is asking, uh, yeah. are there are a lot of urban burning spots in Israel. The answer is yes. I mean, any, some of the best sites uh, during migration seasons are the city parks uh, in Eilat, but also in Jerusalem uh, and in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, Hayarkon Park is a very large green area, a smack in the middle of the city, uh, which right now is hosting stuff like Golden Orioles. Uh, there's a rose-colored starling that was seen there today. Um, all the cool warblers, barred warbler, garden warbler. Um, so right in the middle of Tel Aviv. Uh, Jerusalem has the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, uh, which is right on Parliament grounds in the middle of Jerusalem. Um, very small place, but huge diversity of birds. Any city park in Israel will give you very good birding. It's funny because I've got a story from Jerusalem Bird Observatory. I was with, um, I've forgotten his name, begins with A. Um, I was with um, an Israeli uh, guide and we were in the Rose Garden next to the Jerusalem Bird Observatory and the Rose Garden's on a slope. And we were looking down the slope and we saw a cat with a woodcock in its jaws. So without even thinking, both of us ran down the hill to try and rescue this woodcock. And of course, when we got to the spot, we couldn't find it. We're walking back up the hill and the Jerusalem Bird Observatory is right next to the uh, government building, isn't it? The, yeah, the parliament. There was this guy, sorry? The parliament, yeah. It's next to the parliament. And there was this guy caught, um, climbing over the fence, dressed in a black suit with a gun in his holster. And I was thinking, oh no. And he ran straight towards us and straight away, what are you guys doing? And he obviously thought that I was chasing his friend. <laughs> and uh, uh, luckily he was with me, this guy. So he turned around and said, no, 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 it wasn't that at all. We were looking for birds. So in the end, the guy with his, his, his um, you know, walkie talkie, he let us go. But that was a, that was a moment, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think we're coming near to the end, but I want to ask you another question actually um, about, now, obviously, Israel is your is your domain, but where else do you go birding in the world? What other countries do you love being in to observe birds? Um, anywhere, really. I, I I spend a lot of time in the U.S. Uh, I've I've been to the U.S. every spring uh, for the past six years. I was actually supposed to be in the U.S. right now, as we speak. Uh, we do a lot of promotional work uh, in the U.S. Uh, promoting birding in Israel and participating in the World Series of Birding and and uh, we do sort of a two-week tour meeting with donors and supporters and birding around the US and Canada so I really like uh, North America I love South America uh, I love Africa last year I visited Belarus uh, for the first time uh, we're doing a project with BirdLife now to give BirdLife partners uh, to teach them how to do birding tourism um, in order to create conservation funds. And it's a pilot that we're doing with BirdLife in Belarus. Um, so that really, Belarus was really, really interesting, sort of like old Europe. 
um, real nice forests, good owls, good woodpeckers. Um, but I mean, anywhere, anywhere I go, there's birds. Um, and really, I, I don't really have a favorite place. I, I love Africa, of course. I was in Uganda in late uh, 2019, uh, which was a mind-blowing experience. Beautiful country, amazing birds, amazing primates. Um, but as I grow older, I learn to basically appreciate anywhere I go, and, and I enjoy birding anywhere I go. So, Are, are you a lister? Um, yes, I am. And uh, are you, say, for example, are you one of the biggest listers in, in Israel? Yes, I am. <laughs> Actually, are you? Big? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm either four or five in the, in the country list ever. Um, but I, and I have some pretty easy gaps that I missed over the years. So hopefully I'll climb up there. Um, and actually, uh, my friend and colleague, Yoav Perelman, uh, and me were doing an Israel big year this year uh, in Israel. Uh, sort of messed up uh, the corona issue, the COVID-19 thing uh, sort of slowed us down. Uh, it's not the best year to do a big year. Uh, but like I said, we were fortunate uh, to keep on birding and we're the first people that are actually doing a big year together. But, you know, we're sort of each doing our own. We spent a lot of time birding in the field together, but um, we're doing it separate lists but more or less together helping each other um, and uh, we're already up to 329 species and we both have 329 species which is quite amazing because i have a uh, five birds that he did not see and he has a uh, five that i have not seen and yet we are neck to neck at 329 um, and israel's record year uh, is about 390 ever and uh, we're at 330 and we're in May, so we'll see what happens. But uh, we're enjoying doing it together also, which is pretty cool. 330, Jesus. Um, I added a new one this morning. I had a river warbler this morning, and that's a hard one. Uh, wow. Skulkers. Uh, so I was very lucky this morning, and uh, that's my 329. <laughs> it's incredible. I know you haven't got a favorite bird or mammal for that matter. So let me ask you, what's one of your favorite birding experiences? I have many experiences around the world. Um, I got stranded. Uh, I got stuck in the middle of the jungle in Ecuador for three days with no food and no gear in the jungle because I was looking uh, for screamers. Um, it was quite an adventure. Um, I was birding in Northern Kenya. Uh, in the Chelby Desert uh, with a friend on Camelback. Uh, we were shot at by uh, Sudanese rebels. Uh, so that was quite an interesting experience. Um, so, I mean, various things here and there, but uh, my most, you know, treasured thing in the world is arriving in the desert here in Israel at first light when it's still dark out and to hear the fluting call of Hupo Lark uh, over the plains or a singing Temming Slark, uh, just as the sun's coming up, uh, that gives me goosebumps. Doesn't matter if I've seen it a hundred times. It's uh, really something that, uh, that's what does it for me. And, you know, still a huge flock of storks, huge flock. I mean, these are things that I still get excited about right here at home. And, and uh, right now sharing these things with my kids, it's something that's given a whole new element uh, to this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Well, that, that's uh, that's some some very interesting uh, experiences there. Okay, final call for questions, guys, because um, we're gonna draw to a close. Anyone with any last minute questions? I've got one. Another quick okay, last minute yeah. one. Get my video back up again. Um, yeah, Jonathan, great talk. It was so interesting hearing about Champions of the Flyway, but I just wondered what was your best or your biggest surprise bird that you've seen flying through Israel? Rarest, best, yeah, one that surprised you? Uh, there uh, one. There's been a few. I was fortunate uh, to be involved in finding uh, three country firsts. So finding a country first is always uh, quite amazing. Um, 
one that I can think of is, uh, well, we, we had a redneck stint, the first record, a summer plumaged bird that, you know, I was scanning through a flock of waders and then suddenly, you know, stop at this thing and, and it took a little, you know, identification and, and, and thinking about it. It's not a very striking species. Um, so that's, that's a good one. Um, scanning through large flocks of birds of prey, uh, pulling out uh, a Veros eagle uh, over the Eilat Mountains, a very rare bird in Israel. Um, same thing with a yellow-billed stork in the middle of a flock of storks, a pink-backed pelican in a flock of pelicans. Um, there's been uh, quite a few good surprises uh, over the years. Uh, scanning through flocks in the desert or scanning through the desert, uh, finding a black-crowned sparrow lark, the first one that was seen for 30 years. Uh, that was quite a wow moment. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, I was fortunate to have a lot of these. I think it's really about being out there and being in the field and, and living in Israel. There's something that uh, you know that you have a very good chance to strike gold, you know, in the next time you pan your binoculars. And it's that feeling of uh, excitement and anticipation and the wonders of migration that keep, you know, keeps us ticking still. Fantastic. Well, listen, Jonathan, thank you so much for sparing your time to talk to us today. It's been an absolutely eye-opening uh, conversation with you in conservation. Um, and I wish you all the best uh, for everything you do in the future. And I'm looking forward also to coming back to Israel at some point. Um, Hopefully, to just to go birding, I'm not necessarily to race around, but then if I am, I will be raising some money for that. So that'll be a good thing to do. And I hope everyone else enjoyed this, all the Zoomers here, and anyone else in the future watching this. So, Jonathan Mayra, thank you so much. Um, and for everyone else, we will um, take a little break, and we're back on Monday next week. We've got a week of travel, and there'll be more information on the website. So please take a look during the week, and you'll see who's coming up. All right. Um, well, thank you very much and take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you and keep looking up. <laughs>